This is a marvellous section of Brunel's atmospheric railway piping. It was a catastrophe for uh, the main reason that this pipe, the slot in the top, leaked. Despite having a leather valve and a piston going down there, the rats ate some of the leather. The leather stiffened in winter. It slowly rotted and the vacuum was lost. The idea was to speed trains up over steep gradients in South Devon by using atmospheric pressure. There would be a vacuum in front of the valve because pumping stations every three or four miles would exhaust the air in the pipe and the atmospheric air behind the valve would push the train forward. But after about seven months it was deemed to be an economic failure. This was one of Brunel's failures, but you can't blame him for that because he was a man with engineering thoughts way ahead of his time. And we've got a 10 meter long pipe here at Didcot at the Railway Museum. This is the only Brunelian fixture remaining. Brunel's atmospheric caper. These 22 inch diameter cast iron pipes are a relic of Brunel's flotation with atmospheric traction on the South Devon Railway. The South Devon Railway system comprised stationary pumping engines creating a partial vacuum and in pipes laid between the rails. The pipe was sealed by valves at each end and a metal strip hinged by leather along the length of the slot. The partial vacuum allowed a piston attached to a carriage to be propelled by the greater pressure of the atmosphere behind. This system was intended to be cleaner, quieter and capable of operating trains on much steeper gradients and sharper curves than steam locomotives of the time could manage. Atmospheric operation started on the largely flat section between Exeter and Newton Abbott in February 1848 but was discontinued from the 10th of September after only seven months. The steeply graded Newton Abbott to Totnes section was never operated by atmospheric traction. Failure of the leather hinges allowed air to leak into the pipes, overworking the undersized pumps. The system also proved economically costly. It was three shillings and a penny, or 15 and a half p a mile, against one shilling and four pence, seven pence for steam locomotive working. Today, only the steep gradients and sharp curves of this part of the railway line remain to provide a challenge to great western locomotives and their successors as they struggle to lift their heavy trains over the South Devon banks. So this is Brunel's atmospheric caper. There's one section of pipe which I've shown you on a video from the Steam Museum in Swindon. And this is all we have in extant in Britain. This was discovered in South Devon as a sewer pipe. Fortunately it's been restored, but it's been left here as a wonderful relic of Brunel's triumphs. And just before I sign off, the width of these rails here are seven inches and a quarter. This is the width of the broad gauge that Brunel advocated for trains to be running at faster speeds, more comfort and would be safer, especially around bends where the trains could travel faster. We're stuck with the width of four feet, eight and a half inches because there were thousands of miles more of that width laid before Brunel came along and the system proved not practical because when the broad gauge met the narrow gauge, passengers had to change trains with all their luggage and this took hours of delays. This is Turner's Travels studying Brunel at Didcot, which is on the Great Western Railway line between London and Bristol. And the line went down to Bridgewater, Taunton, Exeter, Plymouth. Penzance.
Thank you for your attention. I hope you find the Brunel experience on video interesting.